Welcome, everybody. We're just uh, starting this webinar on behalf of Colorado State University Center for Protected Area Management and U.S. Forest Services International Programs. I'd like to welcome you to our second session of part two of our webinar series, Protected Areas for Everyone. Really want to thank you for being uh, with us today. My name is Erin Hicks and I will be your moderator and we're just going to give folks a moment to join before we get started. See that we have people joining us and welcome. We'll just give a couple more moments. Great, hope everyone's having a good morning, afternoon or evening, wherever you are connecting from. Um, I think we'll get started. Uh, I would like to thank everyone once again for being with us today. For those who are connected, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, so please use the chat function in Zoom to let us know what country you're connecting from. And uh, once again, I wanna welcome everyone to today's Protected Areas for Everyone webinar titled Barriers and Supports for Women in the Conservation Workforce. Uh, we are so glad you can join us today. My name is Erin Hicks and I will be your moderator for this session. I am the project manager at the Center for Protected Area Management at Colorado State University. Uh, today we are accompanied behind the scenes by our center's co-directors, Ryan Fincham, who will be managing the chat and technology, and Jim Barbrack, who will moderate the question and answer session that we'll have later on. If you have any dif technical difficulties, feel free to reach out to Ryan via the chat feature in Zoom. And we're going to try our very best to keep this webinar to one hour in duration. Today's session is the third webinar in part two of our series, Protected Areas for Everyone, focused on promoting equity and inclusion in protected areas. Our series is co-sponsored by our center at Colorado State University and our partners from the United States Forest Service International Programs. The Spanish version of this topic will be offered this Thursday. We will host our final two webinar sessions of this series in May, focused on universal access for protected areas. And while last month's session, sessions explored the importance of leadership for establishing the tone for equity and inclusion in protected areas and conservation, today's session is specifically focused on the challenges that women conser conservationists face due to gender bias and the supports that help them overcome those challenges in the conservation and natural resource field. Uh, as we discussed before, leadership is essential for driving change in our field. We also know that we need everyone involved in conservation in order to more effectively protect biodiversity and combat the complex challenges that, are fa uh, that face our planet. However, many societies around the globe have ingrained stereotypes and biases that make it harder for some groups of people to fully participate in various aspects of society. In this webinar, we will look at the gender gap in conservation, or in other words, the gender biases that make it more challenging for women to fully participate in the conservation career. Today, we'll have a, concert, a, a, a conversation uh, with our guests, three women conservationists who are actively working to further understand the intersection of gender and conservation and are contributing to paving the way for a future of gender equality in the conservation workforce. Uh, while reducing the gender gap in the conservation career is a large challenge deeply rooted in society, we hope this webinar will inspire you all to connect and engage in meaningful conversation about the current context for women conservationists in your countries and organizations and explore ways to further uh, establish enabling conditions for increased women participation in the conservation field. Ultimately, we hope to leave you today with a note of optimism as we all strive for a brighter future that embraces equity and inclusion in the conservation field at large and in protected areas more specifically. During our session, we encourage you to uh, write your questions or share your questions for our panelists in the question and answer function in Zoom. We will have the opportunity to ask the panelists a few questions from the audience towards the end of this webinar. This session is being recorded and we will provide a link to the recorded session on our webpage. Uh, for, so without further ado, uh, let's go ahead and get to know our, our panelists. Uh, I'm gonna first introduce who we have with us and then we'll give them a chance to, to share a little bit about themselves and what they are working on. 
Uh, first, we have Dr. Megan Jones from our own university, Colorado State University, who's a postdoctoral post researcher. Uh, we, we also are happy to have Jaylene Vera from our, um, our partners at the U.S. Forest Service International Programs, who's a fire program spe specialist in Latin America and the Caribbean. And finally, we have Joni Seeger, um, who is a professor at Bentley University in Massachusetts in the United States. So I wanna just thank you all for being here with us and, and would like to invite you to share a little bit more about who you are and what you're working on, uh, starting with Megan. Thanks so much, Erin. It's great to be here. Uh, as Erin said, my name's Megan and I study women's leadership and gender equity in conservation. And I, I'm a conservation social scientist. So I generally just study uh, leadership in conservation and processes of behavior change and how we can make conservation more inclusive and effective. So really excited to be here with you all. I'm joining you from Fort Collins, Colorado, where it is spring-like and sunny. Thank you, Megan. Jaylene, I'd like to invite Hi. you. Hi. Good morning from Colorado. I'm Jaylene Vera with U.S. Forest Service International Programs and I'm coming in today with about 20 years working in fire and uh, have split that time kind of 10 years on, on in primary firefighter positions and then, you know, 10 years and more of support um, management and now this program specialist role. So I can say I'm, I'm meeting you all today as, you know, both a practitioner and a student of the issues we're talking about and um, I, I hope I can share some of the raw experiences and the impressions you get of kind of being in the realm. And then also what I see as the possibilities of how we can all work on this together and um, some of the opportunities that are out there right now and some of the ways people are coming together on these issues. Thank you, Jaylene. And, and last but not least, Joni. Hi there, thank you. From Boston, hello. Um, gray and chilly Boston. Um, <laughs> since we're giving our weather and geolocation reports. Uh, I, I'm a feminist geographer and environmentalist. I've worked in um, various dimensions of uh, trying to bring gender analysis into environmental issues. I've worked over many years um, and uh, often with some of the large um, environmental agencies such as the UN Environment Program to really see where gender analysis can help illuminate dimensions of problems or of topics or of issues um, that other analyses don't, um, don't necessarily shed light on. So I've done a lot of work on climate change and on international policy and on uh, conservation. And I'm pleased right now to be working in the final stages of a, um, a project sponsored by URSA, the Universal Ranger Support Alliance, on exactly this topic of bringing gender, um, the problems of bringing gender balance into the ranger workforce. Thank you, Joni. Um, well, we'll dive right in because I know you ladies have so much to share from your experience. Um, so I'm gonna start with a question for Dr. Megan Jones. Um, Megan, your research in collaboration with Dr. Jen Solomon from Colorado State University has identified many barriers and supports encountered by women conservation leaders in the US. What are some of the larger barriers and supports that women in the conserva conservation career are facing today that you found in your research? Thanks, Erin. So yeah, it's a great and it's a really important question. And what we know from other fields is that when women enter into male dominated work environments and, and fields that were created historically for and, and by men, um, they're often, at least at first, the only woman in the room and experience some form perhaps of either active resistance to them being there or a, like a, a passive failure to, to support them uh, and to make sure that the workplace works for them. And this happens to many marginalized groups, um, not just women, people marginalized based on race, ability, age, many other things. And so when Jen and I started our research in 2016, uh, there had been very little peer reviewed research on this in conservation, exploring women's kinds of experiences with these situations. So we set out to do an exploratory study to really map out what kinds of barriers 
women had been encountering in US-based conservation and what supports they perceived were helping them. And we set out to do this with an intersectional approach. So looking at those other forms of marginalization, like I mentioned, particularly gender alongside race and age and seniority to, to see how those were shaping women's experiences. And what we found is that the women in, that I interviewed in, in the US uh, in conservation agencies and nonprofits had experienced, uh, all of them had experienced at least one of six categories of gendered barriers. And the vast majority had experienced four or more of these challenges. So these were um, first salary issues. So being paid unequally and feeling unable to negotiate, formal exclusion, being denied promotions, informal exclusion, being excluded from decision-making spaces or not listened to when they were there, uh, as well as sexual harassment at work or while doing conservation work, and uh, accompanied by a, a sort of lack of trust that the organization would act proportionately to address that harassment or protect people who disclose harassment, as well as women reporting experiences that organizations had failed to address it or had failed to protect people from retaliation. Uh, and besides those four types of experiences, many women in conservation in our sample experienced both overt and subtle sorts of interactions with other conservationists, both, both men and some women, that reinforced this belief that women were inadequate to be in conservation science or leadership, or simply that women were incompatible with how we understand who a conservation science or scientist or leader is. Like women being told, for instance, that when they are um, being feminine by wearing dresses or makeup, they are undermining their credibility at work, that kind of messaging. And we also interviewed women uh, about experiences with work-life balance and motherhood, and about two-thirds of our sample were mothers, and many of them pointed to a real conflict between the expectations placed on them as mothers and the expectations placed on them as conservationists and, and conservation leaders. And many of the mothers I interviewed had taken steps to reduce work demands or forego opportunities at work, at least while their kids were young, in order to be able to both be a good mom and be a good conservationist and maintain some sort of well-being and sanity um, in the midst of all that. So that's another gender barrier that it's really important to talk to talk about is, is motherhood um, and then the difficulties, the trade-offs with that. So uh, go ahead, sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, I was just going to ask, are there any supports that, uh, that really resonated that have helped these women overcome these barriers? Yeah, that's the really important next question, right? After you list out all of these things that women yeah. experienced. Um, so the two that came up in the interviews uh, that I'm referring to were organizational changes, first of all. So policies around sexual addressing sexual harassment or maintaining pay equity, and then especially supportive relationships, particularly supervisors who would uh, nurture and, and mentor and champion women to high levels, and also supportive peers, men and women who believed in and worked for gender equity, as well as women you could just kind of vent to about these issues and kind of process the experiences, the shared experiences. And then a, a third that I really, I want to bring up that's something I've been doing research on since this kind of foundational study is about the benefits of spaces like this that organizations and groups can create to discuss women's leadership and gender equity. I've been working with programs around the world who are creating especially women's leadership training programs or, or empowerment programs and some preliminary research there that I've been working on suggests that there can be real benefits to women for their from just having these cohorts of other women to grow into leadership and, and process what they want from their conservation careers together. So I think that's another exciting area to, to look into more. Thank you so much. And uh, I really appreciate that you mentioned the overt and subtle um, barriers that exist because sometimes we overlook or don't give credit to like microaggressions or things that may be perceived as more subtle. Um, 
And do, just as far as the role that future research can play, you mentioned looking into leadership and support groups. Are there any other uh, knowledge gaps that you're looking that you're considering um, doing further research in? There's a lot of knowledge gaps. So if there's any budding grad students or current grad students or researchers out there um, who want to partner on this kind of work, reach out to me, please, because I think it's important we, we tackle this. Um, I think we also still need like a global census of the state of gender equity and conservation worldwide. We have information from the US and from a few, I've got a student who's been working on it in Latin America, um, but that's why I'm really excited about the work Joni's been doing around this global assessment of, of gender in, in rangers um, in the ranger field because it's, we don't have enough of those kinds of inquiries at a, at a global level. Great. Well, thank you so much, Megan. Thanks for that overview. And hopefully those listening that are thinking about a research project, uh, can reach out to our center and we'll get you in, in touch. And we definitely will be sharing links to the research papers that are referenced in, um, between um, uh, Megan and, and Joni's work. Uh, we'll share that on our website after the webinar. Um, I think identifying these uh, barriers and supports openly is is not only important for increasing understanding of the problem, but also starting for starting to build awareness by bringing to light our own experiences and provo provoking that conversation. Um, so I would like to also look at some areas of conservation employment more specifically, and um, and we'll hear from Jaylene Vera um, because while I'm wildland firefighting is one of those areas of conservation employment where women make up a very small percentage. Um, according to a recent na uh, National Geographic article, maybe only around 12% of the workforce, at least I think, I'm not, I don't remember if that was globally or in the US to be uh, transparent. Um, and so Jaylene, I wanted to um, hear from you, what are some of the specific challenges that women wildland firefighters face in their career, um, specific to, to wildland firefighting? And then we'd lo just love to hear more about your work to make wildland firefighting more accessible for women abroad and in the US. Yeah, thank you, Erin. And thank you, Megan. You're, you're lighting up all kinds of things that we've experienced in some of the activities and trainings and leadership gatherings that we've had You know, to identify those localized barriers and successes. And um, it's, it's interesting to think about it through different lenses. So first I wanna talk about the statistic. Um, and yeah, that 12, 13% is definitely reflective of the wildland fire community in the US. And that's among various federal agencies and probably to some extent the state and the local agencies. And it is useful to have the statistics as a baseline because what it tells us is across the board, you know, we're in that percentage range of, of women in the wildland fire workforce. Um, but I wanna say a little bit about what it doesn't tell us too. and that statistic alone doesn't you know, tell us about individual or more localized circumstances. And so in certain areas of the country, you know, we might actually see more, more women involved than that amount. And then other places we're looking more at one, you know, one person out in a remote setting you know, as a sole woman. Um, and then lots of places where there's no visibility of women at all in the wildland fire service. And so that's just in our own country in the US, sort of the variety we see. And then the other thing we don't see in that sole statistic is the overlay of other diversity and inclusion factors. And it doesn't say anything about people of fire, or I'm sorry, people of color in wildland fire or people of color within the, within the gender lens. And so when you start talking about kind of the baseline of, of how we see women in fire and what, what barriers they have, there's a huge issue of visibility. And if we can't see through those different factors, it's really difficult it's difficult to speak to, it's difficult to kind of understand what's happening. And then to talk a little bit about the barriers, um, it's definitely reflective of, you know, challenges we see across the board in our culture and definitely within, you know, the natural resources workforce. And so it traces kind of from the beginning, the outreach and that visibility, you know, do we see women in those roles? Can you even picture you know, yourself as a woman in a firefighter role or in another fire management role? Is there any kind of modeling? Are the people that are doing the hiring, you know, of, of all one gender or of all one appearance? Or is there a variety out there? Are the people making decisions about 
when to recruit, when to hire, all from one background or not. And so that affects the whole process. Um, and then as we go forward, you know, in someone's career, what supports are in place for them to stay in that career and to advance. And for um, people in fire management, you know, it's, it's a few different streams. Do you have opportunities to go out on assignments and get training and get exposed to different situations and build qualifications? And then do you have the ability to compete for different positions and be considered, you know, for that career advancement? And those are those are all things that come up and are active open issues for women in the wildland and fire community in the U.S. And then it goes all the way to leadership. And you know, we we heard in the prior um, CSU session about you know how some of our leaderships taking on issues of gender or diversity inclusion, and um, it's it's not an easy process, especially for the larger organizations, the big institution like the U.S. Forest Service. You know, thirty thousand employees. Um, and then within the wildland fire sect, there's probably 10,000. And so that's a lot of different backgrounds and people coming at this with many different cultural views and worldviews and values and individual circumstances. So um, a lot happening there, but definitely, you know, leaning into what what sort of decisions can we make now? How can we shape our training and all those processes to make sure that we're providing support? And in the US, there's some, some really great examples of things that are happening now um, and that I've just seen over the course of my career. Just last week, I was looking over some basic training materials. And, um, you know, we, we have good standard training materials, but over the course of my career, you know, I've definitely noticed the visuals and those training materials support the norm. You know, you, you see a lot of men, a lot of white men, you know, portrayed just in the basic training materials, that messaging is going out like, this is what it looks like to be in fire management. And in these new materials, I just looked at that image had been overhauled. And all of a sudden I was seeing people of different mm -hmm. backgrounds in the images. And it's pretty exciting to see that happen, you know, over the course of my career. It's important. It's small, but it's important. And then there's other things happening, like more localized networks, um, providing that peer-to-peer -peer support and looking closely at how recruiting is happening and, and, you know, how are we reaching out to different communities to show people there's an opportunity here to get involved. So flipping over to our work in Latin America, um, it, it's, it's only a beginning. There's a lot of work to be done. My understanding as far as the statistic, again, you know, looking at women and fire in Latin America, probably if I had to pull together a few different sources, we're looking at four, three, two percent, you know, that are wow. actually in the formalized wildland fire workforce. And part of that is because, you know, wildland fire as, you know, a paid, uh, a paid position is um, a much smaller amount overall in Latin America. It's an emerging field, I would say, in a lot of places. Um, and so then you have the overlay, you know, complication of um, unpaid labor or labor without any social security, without any benefits. Um, and those things are particularly problematic for women or problematic for people who are primary caregivers. And so those are some big challenges, you know, that are, there's not easy solutions, but they're things we need to be conscious of in the work. Um, yeah. A lot of our, our early work with women in fire or emerging work with women in fire in Latin America has just been to open those spaces that Megan talked about. And it's incredible the response we've got. It's also been surprising once you open the space, how many um, people and women come to light that are working on fire and just aren't recognized in that visibility sector. And they're, they're working as community members or they're working as a collateral duty from another position. Um, things like that are coming out and they, they're really leaning into the opportunity to identify with other women, you know, across, across the world really that are, um, working in fire it, just that connection is so powerful being able to talk share your story and hear that other people have similar stories as well um and yeah. and i really appreciate just identifying that there's so many levels that we can um make leverage and in, or leverage impact that regarding the challenge of involving more women in conservation firefighting that there's just so many uh, levels where we need to work and focus on that it's not just the individual capacity building and it's not just institutional and it's but it's also societal and um, etc. 
Thank you so much, Jaylene. Um, and, and similarly, uh, park rangers are also, uh, women have, a, 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 are represented less as in the park ranger workforce. Um, and so I wanted to talk to Joni uh, Seeger for a moment and, and Joni's been doing research on um, women park rangers in the global park ranger uh, workforce. Uh, she cited in uh, one of her articles that only three to 11% of the uh, range of workforce is female globally. And so Joni, I would love to hear if you could give us a high level overview of your research and indicate what are some actions that we can take to move towards a more gender balanced workforce? And I'm sure there may be an overlap of what our other um, uh, panelists have already said, but would love to hear your perspective. Great, thank you very much. I'm really pleased to be here with Megan and Jaylene and with uh, Colorado State. So thank you for bringing me into this conversation. Um, yes, as, as you said, and as I said at the beginning, I'm pleased to be doing a report with URSA, the Universal Ranger Support Alliance, to examine as comprehensively as possible the problem of um, the gender skew in the ranger workforce. Um, and I'll just start very briefly, Erin, where you, tossed out the numbers that I've tossed out and yeah. Jaylene started, you know, three to 11%. It's like, ah, you know, it's kind of a dartboard. We actually don't know. We really oh. honestly don't know the percent of women rangers pretty much anywhere. I mean, really pretty much anywhere. Um, a few countries, a few national systems have what looks to be reliable data, but um, it's a guess. So three to 11% globally, it's not a very meaningful estimate, but what we all know is that with very few exceptions, women are in a very small minority of um, the ranger workforce, park ranger workforce. Um, and so when I, um, as I'm finishing this URSA report, I kind of divided the explanation, the barriers into two large um, components. One is the general barriers to bringing people into the ranger workforce. And those of you who've worked with rangers know these problems already. Poor pay, difficult working conditions, often inadequate equipment, um, limited opportunities for training and learning, um, complicated and sometimes very informal and uh, challenging employment terms. You know, so these are kind of general barriers for everyone, men and women, um, uh, coming into the ranger workforce. But they have particular gender differentiated effects. And both Jaylene and Megan have already pointed to some of these. So um, the lack of maternity leave, um, the lack of provision uh, for women who may become pregnant, um, the lack of, I just saw a ridiculous thing that the Swiss army, and I realize that's the military, we're not talking about the military, but much of rangering is modeled on militaries. The Swiss army, just literally, I'm talking about last week, decided that one of their problems in bringing women into their armed forces was that to date, they have only provided men's underwear for everyone in the armed forces. Yes, yeah, so Megan, right, it's like slap your forehead. It's like ridiculous. So anyway, so you have these general barriers that do have gender differentiated effects. But what I'm really trying to focus on and which um, Megan and uh, Jaylene have pointed to are kind of the specific barriers for women. So the gender norms that women shouldn't be doing anything that's considered to be outside work or let alone potentially dangerous work. Um, the problems of reconciling work and family responsibilities with, um, with employment and ranger workforces. Um, the origins of rangering, which is very male dominated, very masculinist, often using military analogs, um, leads to both formal and informal exclusion of women. But one of the things that has become just kind of this blaring red alarm through my research is the extraordinary levels, and I mean extraordinary levels of harassment and violence of women in ranger workforces. Um, it's just breathtaking when you actually start to look at the information we have, which is very slim, and uh, uh, listen to women's voices. Um, part of this is amplified because uh, rangering often takes women, as Jaylene pointed out with firefighting, often takes women into remote places, often by themselves with cohorts of men, which is always uh, a potentially dangerous uh, setting. But uh, even without talking about remoteness and women one at a time, just 
the entire ranger experience for many women is infused with violence and harassment and just blatant sexism. Um, so to flip very quickly to um, solutions, solutions in two minutes, um, <clears throat> solutions in two minutes. I, I actually do have um, four high level points that I'd just like to toss out. Mm -hmm. And if we have time, we can talk about them. One is uh, several people who have interviewed for this project brought this to my attention. The images of rangers, and Jaylene was talking about this, that the image of rangers is very male, very militarized, very tough. And we all know that park rangers do some tough, dangerous things, but they also are education experts and environmental interpreters. And we need to shift the imaging and the messaging about rangers to make it a more open space for women. Um, secondly, there needs to be much more awareness of the benefits to everyone of a diverse and inclusive workforce. We really need to kind of ramp up our understanding. This is a win-win for everyone. It's not just mm -hmm. women. Um, thirdly, the sexual harassment and sexual violence really needs to be addressed in the most robust ways. There really needs to be zero tolerance. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I had several people, male rangers, tell me that, uh, well, in fact, one person in particular said, oh, no, there is no such thing as sexual harassment. And it's like, interesting, wrong. That's just wrong. And so either he was denying it or he didn't understand what sexual harassment was. And we need to kind of peel away that onion. But uh, anti-violence, anti-harassment training and policies and procedures and consequences needs to be really emphasized. So I'll stop there. Yeah, do you want to dive? We have a, a, a if you want a couple more minutes, because I think the solutions are so important. Did you want to dive a little deeper, Joni? Well, I, I would just add, add one more. Um, yeah. in to the imaging of rangers and the understanding of the amplification effects of diversity, the problem with violence, I would say, the, uh, which both Jaylene and Megan have also pointed to, is there's just so much we don't know. I mean, Megan was talking about research we, we don't know. Um, we, don't, we don't have, and going back to what I started, we don't even have basic data. You know, how many women are there? How many rangers are there? I mean, even that information seems to be in some ways lacking. There's no place for um, information to be, there's no central place, um, but gender disaggregated information, information about gender. And as mm -hmm. both Jamie and, and Megan have pointed out, not just gender, but kind of an in intersectional view, completely lacking. Um, but if you had to, if I had to uh, uh, put one thing as the highest priority, well, I put two things. One is the amplification of the diversity, the benefits of diversity, but secondly, really addressing this violence issue. I mean, it's just absolutely has turned up at the top of my agenda as I've been doing this research. Wow, yeah, and it's always so hard to hear that there is so much gender-based violence and that so many women are going through that. And I, um, I, I do wanna open it up to the panel before we go to our last question to have any thoughts or reflections, um, especially Megan and, and, uh, and Joni, um, since you guys, since um, you ladies went first, um, any, any thoughts or responses to what's been discussed so far? One thing I guess that um, Joni made me think of, and I'd love to hear Jaylene talk about the comparison between wildland and ranger um, issues. Uh, Cause I do think this remote piece of conservation work, many types of conservation work is really um, a, a structural problem. But I think that there's a lot of feminist and gender scholarship from beyond the environmental space about how sex-based, gender-based harassment and violence is often, we often think that sexual harassment is a sign of sexual interest, but there's a lot of research that her, this form of harassment and violence is a way, is a, it's a tool of enforcing existing power hierarchies. And it is used consciously or unconsciously against people who challenge existing structures and hierarchies and assumptions. So not just women, but also LGBTQ folks mm -hmm. and women of color, who um, masculine women, um, people who challenge our assumptions of masculinity and femininity and who does what kind of work. And so I think it's really important to, 
to look at the, to, to get the baseline data of who's in the room, who's in the field, to look at what their experiences are when they're in those spaces, but then also to do a more structural, holistic critique of why these things are happening. And often, and, and recognizing that the way that we as humans marginalize people who come into professions where they have been historically excluded, we have a whole suite of tools that we can use to keep people from having power in professions, whether it's keep them from advancing to leadership roles, from getting opportunities, um, questioning their own competence, questioning their right to be there, mm -hmm. all the way through to overt acts of physical and sexual violence and harm. So I, I think it's really important to frame it in that lens of, um, you know, not that the people who are doing the, the actions are aware structurally that, you know, like yeah. that I am enforcing a power hierarchy here, but that is what those actions tend towards. So that's just a, a bigger, higher level point I wanted to make for our more ongoing discussion here today. Thank you so much, Megan. Jaylene, do you have anything to add? Yeah, maybe just cycling back to a bit of, you know, I guess fire management 101 and, and how that um, relates to, you know, gender issues. In the, here in the US, we're recovering from a hundred years of the suppression mentality and we've come to understand as fire managers that fire can play a positive role on the landscape that it can be a management tool um, and that there's cultural uses of fire that we, we really want to involve in our system and our management outlook and within that you know I think we as a fire management community or a broader natural resource community need to arrive at this understanding that our previous ideals of the people and the image who, who were able to take on these tasks and the roles they play has changed or it needs to be adjusted. And, you know, I liked what Joni said, you know, about the qualities of a good ranger. And I see that in the fire realm too, that no longer do we only need this sort of masculine image of somebody that's going to combat fire on the landscape. We need educators, we need planners, um, we need leaders, and um, we need people that can relate to different parts of society and play different roles. And if we think we're gonna be able to solve those problems and those challenges with a sole profile, we're never gonna come up with the answers we need. Thank you so much. Uh, th there's so much we could talk about during this time and really appreciate your perspectives. And I, and I hope um, this conversation is helping um, inspire those who are listening to think of little ways that they could in, um, promote uh, better uh, women participation in the conservation field by leveraging any one of these um, areas that they can uh, make a difference. Um, it, it, it's such a complex uh, situation and, and the building awareness, understanding the problem, filling in those knowledge gaps in addition to uh, looking at ways to, uh, to implement structural change um, and, and everything that you've mentioned is, is um, so important to, to really explore and, uh, and, and to address. I, I do wanna invite everyone um, to just close, just before we go to, uh, to the audience questions, I wanna close on a positive note and just hear what gives you hope for the future for gender equality in the conservation field. And uh, I imagine we have many women who are working in conservation that are tuned in today. So if you have any words of wisdom or inspiration for those listening to the webinar, that would also be much appreciated. And I'll throw it to Megan first. Thanks, Erin. Yeah, it's a really rich discussion. I'm sure we could spend a lot more than an hour today talking <laughs> about this. Um, I was thinking about this beforehand, and I, I think that sort of to points that the other panelists have made, you know, the only constant thing about conservation is that it's constantly changing and we're evolving the field and trying to do it better and trying to recognize that equity and inclusion and diversity are parts of doing this work more effectively because they give us new ideas and um, bring in important perspectives and are just the, the right thing to do. So I think for me, I'm just hugely inspired by the people around the world uh, who are working towards making conservation more inclusive and equitable for women and for people from developing countries. 
to lead their own conservation um, efforts in their own countries. And so I, I, that's, that's where I find hope. Um, and that's where I guess if I had suggestions for the, the, anyone on the call, anyone on the webinar today, if you're interested in about doing this work um, for yourself personally, for your peers, for your colleagues, for your children coming up, um, to find those communities of people in your organizations, in your areas, or worldwide with the technology we have, who can, you can work together to make these changes and create spaces for these conversations and, and strategize and, and support each other when it gets really tough um, and, and find that community because it's, it's increasing where the community is growing of people who are working to change this. Thank you, Megan. Uh, Jaylene, any words of hope or inspiration? Yeah, I think the power is in the people and some of the work we've done in Latin America has been really amazing to see the, the ripple effect of, you know, one training or one encounter where we say, you know, women are doing this work and these are ways that they're forging ahead. And yes, let's acknowledge the barriers they're facing and people taking that message forward to so many other spaces and creating their own events or networks um, to provide peer support, to push the issue. Um, and, and then those things going ahead and you know, affecting the institutions, which are usually like slower and longer, longer to change. And, and so everything can have a ripple effect, um, even if it's at a very localized, you know, on your crew, on your park, in your program effect, um, it does link into these longer, bigger processes to affect change. Thank you, Jaylene. And Joni? Yeah, a couple of last comments. Um, mm -hmm. I would uh, endorse everything that Jaylene and Megan have said, and also say that I think that generally in um, many places, in many societies, we're coming to realize, collectively, we're coming to realize that gender equality is good for men too. It used to be kind of presented as though it's like some kind of welfare program for women. It's like, no, a gender equal society is a healthier, stronger society uh, and everyone benefits. And I think that, understanding is, um, uh, is, is slowly being um, taken up. Um, and secondly, I think, and this kind of reflects a comment that Jaylene made about the shift in kind of the notion about firefighting or the perception of it. I think that I see in conservation and in um, parks, protected area conservation, there's a really significant shift from the origins in physical sciences and biology um, to now understanding that conservation is um, uh, a problem or is an issue, an opportunity of social awareness as well as kind of physical, the physical sciences. And that shift to a social frame of analysis and a social frame of understanding really opens up um, uh, the field for people of different expertises and different skills and different capacities. So I'll end on that up note. Yeah, thank you so much, Joni. And uh, yeah, just I, I want to say that all you three are inspiring or inspire me by your work and just uh, and really grateful for everything that you have shared with with us today. Um, and I uh, would, would like to invite Jim Barbarak from our team uh, to open up to questions from the audience. Uh, and hopefully we'll get a couple questions in. Um, to ask our panelists. Thank you very much, Aaron. It's great to see we have over 60 people uh, listening in and watching and uh, from 20, more than 20 countries in Europe, Asia, North Central and South America, the Caribbean and Africa. So good to see all of you uh, online. Uh, our first question that uh, I'll pose to all three of you because I think you all might have good, good insights on it is from Carlos Valderrama of Colombia. And he asked, each of you to give five suggestions for men who obviously have to be are part of the problem and part of the solution in this and what can be done to change their attitudes, uh, their behaviors, uh, their way of doing business. And what five suggestions could you give the male conservationist uh, to be more inclusive uh, in the workplace? Mm -hmm. I can, I can take a start there and maybe the others can fill in if we don't get to five. Um, one of the most power thing, 
powerful things that, you know, uh, uh, a male leader, you know, in, let's say in a park, like in your position, Carlos can do is make it safe. It's fundamental. Um, and so, you know, setting the tone for the others, the other men you work with, that there's absolutely no tolerance and no acceptance of any sort of violence or harassment is really, really fundamentally important. And as, as we bring or include women into this workforce, we need to be able to let them know from the leadership and from the organizational standpoint, they're safe. That's really important. And then another really important thing is providing the mentoring and training. And so if and as you include women in your workforce, you know, are you providing them opportunities to build their skill set and letting them arrive with, you know, whatever skills and background they have and helping them build up areas that they may not have the same competencies or the same life experiences that their male counterparts have. I know in, in one of our trainings in Latin America, we were working with a fire, a water pump, and um, it was an entry level training. There was no expectation that the women in that training had water pump experience, but part of the scenario was for them to do some things with the equipment and, um, you know, take it apart, put it back together. And it was a no fail safe space to do that in the training. But a lot of the women were hesitant to even touch the equipment because they were afraid they would break it. And so we really had to just break down that fundamental thing, like, we're going to support you and help you learn, and it's okay. What else, Megan and Joni? Megan? Yeah, those are great points, Jaylene, and I would reiterate them. I think also part of that last piece you mentioned about confidence, when you're, when you're supervising women, when you're mentoring women, when you're a peer mentor for other women who, you know, who are at your level, um, recognize that they may be getting a lot of messages from around them that they're not supposed to be here and that they're not good enough and that if they fail, it will be held against them. And so active encouragement can, from you can help maybe buffer them from some of those uh, messages on a broader level, even if you're not um, part of the problem, like being actively encouraging is really important. I also think being in spaces like this, thank you very much to all of the men here today who are interested in learning about experiences that you might not have yourself directly. Although of course, um, we haven't talked about masculinity too much today, but there's lots of ways that masculinity can be toxic for men as well, particularly around safety or vulnerability um, and expressing emotions and, and taking safe precautions and dangerous work. So that's a whole nother conversation, but really, taking the time to, to be, to learn yourself through these formal spaces and to listen to the women you work with and invite, create safe spaces for them to talk with you about this stuff and bring up things that might be shocking or surprising or that you might have an instinctive response that that's not happening. I haven't seen that. Um, surely we're past that now. Um, that know that if they're talking to you, it's real. And they, these things are real, even if you're not seeing them and, and listening to those experiences. And I think the other thing is that um, as men, you may have more power in organizations to call out issues of gender inequality. You know, women might be seen as, or worrying about being seen as a complainer or, um, you know, needing special treatment or, you know, already having to prove herself on all these other fronts, does she even have time to take on institutional change when she's just trying to keep her head above water? So use your own power to invest in um, the organization changing and asking those questions of, do we have a sexual harassment policy? How do people report harassment? How are they responded to? Have we assessed, do we know how many men and women are in our organization? Have we assessed how they are paid equally or unequally? What do we do if we know that there's unequal pay? Um, you, can, you can initiate those changes and, and really drive that using your position. Thank you. Joan? Well, um, just to say that those are fantastic points that both Megan and Jaylene have made. Um, and I think the role of enlightened leadership is absolutely key in all of the ways that Jaylene and Megan have pointed out. Um, I would also say for men who may not be in leadership positions, um, who are peers, that the, if nothing else, the Me Too movement, um, which has also come to conservation, um, has put attention 
um, not only on uh, harassers and perpetrators of violence and bias, but on enablers. And so just as Megan was saying, um, all of us should not be bystanders, silent bystanders, when we see inappropriate behavior and whether that's around racism or around sexism, or certainly around uh, violence in any sphere, that um, we all need to uh, not enable um, uh, these behaviors. Um, and um, I just had one practical point for men who might have, for leaders who might have um, opportunities to send uh, people in their organization to training sessions or to uh, educational opportunities, make sure that the, the people you select, the staff you select for those opportunities are representative um, uh, of the diversity that not only you have in your organization, but that you'd like to see in your organization. So I've talked to many people who say, oh, we ran a training session and asked um, uh, ranger staffs, organizations to send people and they sent all men. It's like, stop that, <laughs> just stop that. <laughs> uh, on that I'll end, thank you. Can I jump in, sorry, with one more point. Um, joni has been really great about pointing out that gender equality benefits everyone. And one area that to Carlos's question is about work-life balance. And women often bring up issues of work-life balance because they're taking on more child rearing and caregiving at home, but everyone needs good work-life balance and everyone needs space for their own personal time and family time. And men often have to accept more time away from family as a condition of work. And so that's work-life balance is an issue that men can come together with women on to fight for both, for everyone um, to have better working conditions. And, and that takes us to our, our second question, which is how can women advocate for themselves on issues on reaching leadership positions regarding pay equity and regarding work-life balance? If each of you could address that quickly. Jamie? Yeah, I think the first one, you know, that I've experienced is have the mentality of I'm in this in the, for the long haul and I'm going to figure it out. And you'll always run into people that are going to be, you know, as we said, overtly <laughs> counter to, you know, your presence or, you know, subtly and have the mindset that all that is sort of noise in the background of your career focus um, and have the commitment to get through it and or, or to move around it. And, you know, you may have to reach out to other supports if it's not in your immediate, you know, local environment that you're working in. You may have to look for different opportunities, but commit to the long haul and commit to, you know, personal resilience to get through some of the challenges that you might encounter. Thanks, Megan? Yeah, exactly. I think finding those communities and those spaces inside of work or outside your organization, outside conservation entirely that build you up and nurture you and, and feed you and keep you going. Um, we need you, <laughs> we want you here for the long haul and um, future women in this field need you. So we need you to stay and be happy first of all. And then when you have space and time to think about bigger change, you know, find your people who can help you make those bigger changes. But also be compassionate on yourself if you're going through hard times um, and big struggles that you don't have to solve all the problems all at once. And it's okay to prioritize. It's important to prioritize taking care of yourself first and building that, um, you're maintaining your own well being. Great. And thanks to Nicolette for that question. And Joni, if you don't mind, since we're running out of time, there's a question I'd like to uh, devote specifically to you. And it's from uh, one of our colleagues uh, who asked about uh, the issue of domestic violence uh, as it affects women in conservation. Are there any specific studies on this? Or is this something that needs more research? Or is all, all we have to date anecdotal information? Um, no and yes. Um, <laughs> no, there's no studies uh, that I'm aware of, and I think I would have seen them by now on specifically domestic violence, by which for the, this conversation, I guess we'll just take um, as a definition kind of as household or intimate partner relationship violence. I haven't seen any studies of that in relation to conservation. Um, of course, we know that it um, is a factor in men's and women's lives, no matter what their profession. Um, the 
the studies that I've seen that come close to this um, talk about the extent to which in some parts of the world, um, uh, rangering is becoming more militarized and there's much more armament. And to the extent that uh, guns are now, um, to the extent that militarized rangering is becoming more of the norm, again, in some places, um, that no doubt uh, magnifies if you will, everyday ordinary violence and the uh, availability of guns kind of floating around small communities, often small communities, also accelerates the possibility of extreme violence in non-rangering settings. That is when it, you know, bringing it home. Um, we absolutely need more research on this um, uh, on pretty much every aspect of it. And there's absolutely no data that I'm aware of. Thank you. And then one last question, if any one of you take, want to take it on, and I'll turn it back over to Aaron. And this is an interesting one, because there are uh, conservation subfields where women uh, are the majority or are well represented, have been for a long period of time. But one might think that women have been pegged to work in those fields. Examples of that are environmental education, but also, and uh, this question is from uh, Ana Gabriela Fontura of Brazil, is that in the tourism field, in ecotourism, everything related to conservation tourism, women seem to have more of a niche. However, they're not often represented in the leadership uh, positions. There seems to be a glass ceiling beyond which it's difficult for them to move ahead, particularly in government agencies. Any comments on that particular phenomena of, of, of that there are areas in conservation where women are more common, like tourism or, or environmental ed, but they also face barriers, particularly to achieving leadership positions. Any one of you? I would just say that that's a really important issue to bring up and that it's, it's, it's important that we have these conversations, not a, just about are women 50% of the conservation workforce total, but are they getting to the highest levels and having the power on the strategic decision-making of organizations? And this trend of women dominated professions where the men are still getting to leadership and getting promoted faster um, than women. We see that in nursing, for instance, which is a female dominated profession, but men can get often get promoted faster um, than, than women. So paying attention to those processes and, and really thinking about how not only our, dis our discourse about conservation is gendered and the environment, but also how we think about power is gendered. So when we think leader, think male, that's a, a phenomenon that's been documented across cultures. And that's a separate and important issue to address alongside bringing women up in the field and making sure that they're thriving at all levels, lower down in organizations. Thanks, Megan. I'm gonna turn it back over to you now, Erin, cause I know we're running short on time. And yeah. my apologies to those of you that might have put questions in at the very end. It's always difficult to get to all of them, but we got the most of them this time. Thank you all very much for your questions and for the responses from our panelists. Yeah, thank you, Jim. And those were such great questions from our um, audience listening in. Um, well, I'd like to go ahead and start to bring the session to close, although we could talk on for hours and days um, and continue on this conversation. Hopefully you'll bring this con these conversations home with you or to your workplace and continue to discuss uh, these concrete actions that have been uh, shared and, and look for other resources that could help um, you address uh, this issue in your own workplace and community. Uh, I'd really like to thank our panelists for their contributions today. So thank you so much, Megan, Jaylene, and Joni for sharing your research, your experience and insight. I think you left us all with great inspiration for ways to, for concrete ways we can make the conservation career more inclusive and, and the reason why it's just so important to do. And uh, thanks to all who have joined us today from around the world. We look forward to seeing you in our future webinars. Uh, Ryan's just put on the screen our upcoming webinars for May. Um, we do have our webinar on this very topic today for this Thursday, but it'll be in Spanish. So, so for our Spanish speaking audience, um, come join us. And then on May 4th and May 6th, we'll have our English and Spanish sessions on broadening access in protected areas and parks, working to ensure equal access. Also, um, you'll be receiving an evaluation as a follow-up to this webinar, and we appreciate you filling that out to provide us with more information for future sessions. 
Uh, it will also be, we'll also be putting links to the research articles from our panelists on our webinar series website in addition to the recording. Uh, give us a day or so to, to do that and uh, we'll have that up on our website. And just want to thank, um, thanks again to our team here at Colorado State University, our collaborators, collaborators at the U.S. Forest Service International Programs, our panelists, and to everyone here with us today. I just wish everyone a great day, and thank you so much. Take care to all our panelists, and thank take you. care to everyone from across the world. Thank you. Thank you.